What's up guys? We are here at the Cooler Master Factory in Huizhou, China. And Steve Burke from Gamers Nexus and I spent the entire day inside this factory. This is their thermal factory. So we got to take a look at all kinds of coolers, uh, fin stacks, heat pipes, and all kinds of other really interesting stuff. What we're gonna do is we're actually gonna do a sit down. We're gonna talk about what we saw inside. I'm gonna roll some B-roll over the footage so you guys can see what we saw inside this factory. And we're gonna discuss what we thought was interesting and what we did not expect to see in there. So let's check that right out after the intro. What's up guys? I am sitting here editing this video that you're about to watch and it was a very fun, free-flowing conversation that Steve and I had uh, here in China. Just wanted to mention two really quick things. One, we did talk about a company in this video that, as it turns out, ultimately we were not supposed to be talking about. So you will hear a bleep in here. I do apologize about that. Uh, second thing is, our only light source in this hotel in China was natural. So as the sun went down and our light ran out, the camera was compensating by jacking up our ISO. So the end of the video does look a little bit grainy, but I think that the end result still comes out really good. And I hope you guys enjoy this video and this discussion that I had with Steve. Uh, so let's get right into it. All right guys, so yesterday actually we went through the entire Cooler Master Thermals factory and we had intended to make this video yesterday, yes. but I was really tired and Steve really wanted to do it. Yeah. And then today, <laughs> today, uh, our schedules just didn't really match up. So we're trying to shoot this tonight. Hopefully, we don't just completely blank on everything that we saw. I but, think we're good, although people are going to comment on the bed in the background. I mean, who's to say what's going to happen later? Just, you know, teach their own. Yeah. Just, just let it be. So the first thing that they did when they sat us down in there was they're like, hey, we're Cooler Master. We make all this computer stuff, but look at everything else we do. Right? Yes. And it actually didn't, I wasn't even aware that they were into that much stuff. Well, they handed me that one, the giant uh, network, like the antenna. Yeah. Sync, the vapor yeah. chamber. They're like, what do you think this is? And I said, a vapor chamber for, uh, I don't know, something. Something? It's like Something enormous? Yeah. They're just like, well, it's for networking. It's like, oh, oh, of course. Okay. Yeah. I'm an idiot. Yeah. I well, didn't, they're I didn't into like, that. they do, they do all the cooling for like telecom yeah. and, um, obviously a lot of other companies as well, which, you know, we may or may not talk about, right. but they're just into, they have their hands in so many different cooling applications. Um, yes. And, Cooler master. I had no idea was as massive as Cooler master is. Yeah. And we're kind of discovering that as we're yes. going along. Um, but obviously, uh, I mean, I don't know how much of my audience is aware, but not only are they making their own coolers, but they do make like stock coolers for AMD, Intel, uh, Intel and in yes. Um, and we did get to see a lot of that, although I'm not sure how much of that we're gonna we're gonna take a look at today. Although um, certainly show you guys the uh, the AMD stock coolers. Yeah. Um, but after we kind of got uh, introduced to what they were doing, what they're you know what they were into, and like their entire timeline kind of they went through from yeah. like 1992 on uh we went right over uh and they showed us how they validate equipment um and i actually found that pretty interesting the C uh, cnas yeah the testing. cnas testing systems it's some uh so they said it was like a china equivalent of an iso standard which i actually wrote down the iso standard if anyone in your audience iso 1735 equivalent i believe we're both very familiar with ISO. that's standard. the one that i know yeah that's yeah yeah, so, I, I'm glad it was that one because I didn't prepare any of the other items. Right, that's the documentation I brought. Right, yeah, me so, too. Uh, but but the, the, it actually was pretty thorough. Like they had testing equipment for almost um, almost everything that they make and also they're able to validate external hardware. So yeah. other companies come to, they and come to them and say, hey, please validate this for us as far as like pressure, color, um, measurements. And the color was, yeah, color is a good one. There are some companies in the industry that are uh, genuinely insane about how much, how the, specific their color has to be. Some companies are. Some companies. Right. Yeah. Leather jackets are normally involved. Uh, in the, the color of the leather jackets. Yes. Right. Right. It has to be exact. Exactly the same color right. every time. Right. Not naming names. No, I, we wouldn't. No. But some companies really want their color to be precise. Right. So Cooler Master can validate that. And that, that whole lab, they weren't really using it when we were there, but... Uh, I have 
the exact investment, but it was uh, it was a lot of money that they invested six million dollars USD. They invested in building that lab. Well, they showed us like I, I don't remember exactly what it was. It was some kind of colorimeter, like handheld yes. colorimeter. Yeah, that was like ten thousand dollars. Yes. So and they they I mean they had all kinds of other machines, but they like crushed the fan for us. Yeah. Uh, or almost crushed the fan for us. Um, but yeah, that whole section of Cooler Master obviously is involved in validating their own stuff and other people's stuff as well. So again, that's, that's the bigger thing too is that it's all business to business. Yeah. So you know, you kind of think like, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna buy from some other brand. Cooler Master is like maybe not in the front of your mind for cases or coolers. Cooler Master probably doesn't really care too much what an individual user buys because. You're looking at B2B applications where businesses can come to them because other businesses don't want to invest $6 million yeah, in validation lab. equipment. Right. right. Yeah, and they have it all just right there. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, they're obviously doing a lot of B2B work. Um, but then we kind of went through that facility. Uh, we saw things like the, the thermal chambers. Yeah. Um, we saw things like the salt, uh, salt exposure chambers, which was hysterical because yes. they looked very interesting. But the way we got to film it was, it was she opened it, and then you you started pointing your camera at it, and then she's like <laughs> slammed it closed. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, but it did look pretty interesting because a big plume of salty smoke came out of there. But that's how they test for like corrosion, yeah. uh, and weathering, and, and all that. Um, so, and I know that you have experience, like or at least some experience with that uh, prior. Yeah. So, how does that compare to like what you've seen before? So I worked with um, thermal chambers a little bit at. Dell and a little bit. So we, we had a building at Dell that had uh, thermal chambers that had shock and vibe chambers, which is a little different with what Cooler Master showed us. And then also one of our contacts locally uh, is a, a botanist and has a thermal chamber that we work with for GN. Mm -hmm. So the ones that Cooler Master has have a wider range, thermal range than I'm, I've been used to. And they're also uh, way bigger, which is important. So I think I wrote down the range too. But the I think I did too, actually. Yeah, so minus 70 to 150 degrees Celsius for the climate-controlled chambers. They also have thermal shock chambers, yeah. where in under five minutes, it goes from minus 65 to 150 degrees Celsius. Right. And so that's really useful for, like, if they're testing a cooler, liquid cooler, and they want to see, uh, will there be some kind of catastrophic failure, like the liquid freezes and uh, sealant blows or something like that yeah and then next to that they had the one that kind of ate that kind of goes up in steps instead of just blasting it yeah with, well 150 c right it'll step it up until i assume failure yeah either until failure or yeah probably until failure and then they had other ones that are just um they didn't i was surprised so one thing i know from from my own experience has been thermal cycling is the best way to age something where you you Cool it, you heat it, and you just repeat that process a lot. Yeah, they had they had that chamber too. It was uh, they what they explained to us was it was like a fifty x aging yes. process. And for so, most of those, they keep them just at one temperature constantly. Right. Which is uh, is is not how I've done it in the past, but I'm positive Cooler Master knows what they're doing. So it seems that it's way. Just a different approach, I guess. Yeah, but those chambers. I mean, they had them all in one room, and they were just kind of lined up next to each other, and you could kind of see like if a product comes in and needs to be validated in some way thermally, they probably have the facilities to be able to do that. Yeah, and a lot of this stuff too is not really for real world use. It's, I, I think, we addressed this in one of our videos where I was concerned that commenters would be like, okay, you're testing a case or an air cooler in a thermal chamber, when am I ever gonna encounter that in the real world? Yeah. The idea is more of that it's, it's useful for simulating things like aging quickly, so, they're not going to test a liquid cooler for five years before they release it to see if it fails in five years. That seems right? like the smart thing to do. Yes, yeah, <laughs> you got to simulate it. Right. So that's what they do. Um, yes, yeah, so that that area was was pretty interesting. Yeah, and then we moved from that over to um, an area that neither of us really have yeah. that much experience with, but I actually found really interesting, which was like the light distribution machine. Um, I don't. I don't know that I wrote down the exact name of that. Oh, I did actually. I I the have. integrating sphere. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that big green sphere. Right. So apparently, I'll quick note here too. Yeah. Some of the names that I've written down are just from the names above the machine, and the the translations aren't necessarily perfect. So well, I have one written down for the machine that tests the vibration of the packaging. 
Yes. Um, and I, you may have the same name for that yes. that vibrating machine. Yes, the vibrating machine. Right. Yeah. Um, which was a source of comedy while yes. we were on the tour. Right. Um, <laughs> but, no particular reason. Uh, no, none no. at all. No. Uh, but, so the integrating sphere, that big green sphere, the yeah. way they... Um, I actually, I think we were both a little confused when we saw it at first, but they used it to test light sources instead yes. of test consistency of like packaging colors or anything like that. So they're, what they're doing in there is they're testing bulbs for RGB, uh, uh, consistently across the spectrum. Yeah. I, I'm still not a hundred percent sure what they were doing with Light test. I know nothing about light testing. That's what I. Neither do I. No. Uh, but it was. I, it's we, cool though. It was cool to see, and then you got blasted in the face. Yes. By a giant light bulb. Yeah. Uh, in a dark room. <laughs> How's it going, Brian? Oh, yeah. It seems to be going doing pretty well? well. I'm doing okay. Okay. Well, yeah. that's one of us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that it, there was like a laser involved. There was a laser. The cooler master was trying to kill me. They tried. Yeah. Uh, he's resilient though. Yeah, I so don't. yeah, he's there. Well, you didn't duck it first. <laughs> That's true. Because I shoved the camera in your face. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, I don't. I'm not 100 percent sure what that was. I know they test bulbs, and yes. I know that the room's pitch black when they do it. Yeah, I think. That's it. I think. Um, so it was testing intensity at certain steps, certain distances yeah. from the source. So I think they could change the bulb that they're projecting with, and then test the intensity right, along right. the line. But as far as like applications for that, I not that, really that yeah, versed in that. That well, I know that Cooler Master is in. I don't know if I can say what percentage, but Cooler Master is in a majority of street lights. I, I yeah, I heard them. I heard we, yeah, we yeah. talked about that yesterday. For both, it's a lot for both the cooling the cooling solution and actually bulbs too. Right. Which I did not know Cooler Master was involved in bulb manufacturing. Also involved in wine manufacturing, wine cooler yes. manufacturing. And wine. And Oh, uh, they had their own, the, the little you, wine, the little things in wine, right? Yeah, were you in the room for that discussion? Yeah, I was in okay. the room for that discussion. Yeah, it uh, sounds really good. <laughs> no footage of that. So, uh, but uh, yeah, so we went through that whole like lighting section. Um, and then we, uh, we got to hang out in the acoustic chamber, which... Um, in addition to being pretty impressive, was full of asbestos yes. and uh, about 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah, uh, so the, it's pretty common practice uh, to use asbestos for for semi-anechoic or anechoic chambers. Yeah. So before anyone freaks out, uh, that is... It was fine. That is normal. <laughs> it is contained. I asked one of our previous tour guides uh, at, a, at a different anechoic chamber tour, I said, what's in those foam blocks? And he said he was from uh, Taiwan, and his English wasn't perfect. And he said asbestos. And I said, "Oh, are, are you sure? Like, <laughs> are you sure it's asbestos?" And he said, "Yeah, yeah. If it caught fire, it would be very bad." Like, oh, okay. <laughs> it is asbestos. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, I guess that's just. I don't know if it's like a really porous. I'm sure you have someone in the audience who's a sound person, but I don't know if it's just porous or something. But their noise floor was uh, six, six dB. Six dB. Yeah. Yeah. So, and when you walked in there, like, I, so that was my first time in any kind of uh, acoustic chamber mm. of that type. Um, and when you walk in there, it's almost like your ears are popping. Yeah. Right. It's a really kind of bizarre feeling because you're not, I guess, because you're not receiving any echo from it's, anywhere. A lot of the travel and noise is killed. So, like, yeah. if you clap, uh, the clap won't carry. Right. It'll just die. It just and, dies. Yeah. And we were trying to listen to them speak about it, but the, the guy who was talking was standing yeah. across the room. You can hardly hear him. The sound just goes nowhere. Yeah. Um, it is a pretty impressive room, and it's built on shock, uh, some some kind of suspension the room system. The is isolated, yes. Yeah, um, suspended. Yeah. So, but have you been in um, chambers that are zero dB? Yes. I have been in the Logitech chamber in um, Portland, Oregon. Yeah. is really impressive. It's, it's a room within a room. The room is also suspended and then you stand on a suspended chicken wire floor huh. with foam blocks below you above you on all sides and when i asked them what's the noise floor of this room they said approximately zero db yeah is so, it is it markedly different standing in that kind of a room yes because if you close the door in that room and everyone stops talking you can hear the blood inside of your head oh yeah well that's pleasant no <laughs> <laughs> yeah they uh they talked about how like 
if you if you were to close yourself in there and like turn the lights off, you know, you'd probably go crazy pretty quickly. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, because couldn't even hear yourself talking to yourself. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Your voice does not travel far. Yeah. Uh, but we actually went through after that um, the vapor chamber and heat pipe section. Yeah. Which is a lot more applicable to our audience. Um, Vapor chamber stuff was definitely interesting. We weren't allowed to film anything yeah, just, in there. Just the one part where uh, you filled it, right? Where you made your own yeah, vapor we, chamber. Yeah, I made my own vapor chamber. Probably failed horribly. They definitely yes. had to redo that one. I wrote uh, down the... Uh, I think both of us took like a little over a minute. Yeah, something like those. that. And they said that it takes their skilled technicians uh, under 20 seconds on average. Right. So we were right up there with the yes. skilled technicians. We were almost there. Yeah. Right. We were uh, pretty close. We were close. If the YouTube thing doesn't work out, the, I got an invite to go back. Really? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So to be a vapor chamber technician. Yes, that's impressive. It is. Thanks. I didn't get one. Well, you know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, but then we moved over to heat pipes, um, where they make. Did you write down how many? Yes. 50,000 50, heat pipes per yes. day. It's quite a few. Yeah, 50,000 heat pipes per day in-house, so the heat pipes are not purchased from a third-party supplier. Uh, a lot of the a lot of the time when you hear a company say, we make this in-house, it's it's complete BS. Yeah. They buy or it. They're, or they're just putting their stamp on yes. it and saying, we made it, right. something like that. So this is, they actually are just buying the copper material and then making the heat Fabricating pipe. the heat pipes. We saw the whole process, mm. um, which I had never seen before. I don't know if you had. No, I actually uh, haven't. Yeah, so there's a couple different ways you can make a heat pipe. There's a powder coating in the inside or a mesh coating in the yeah. inside. Both of us thought the mesh coating would be better for capillary action, but they insisted that the powder coating was so, better. Yeah, I thought, I think, I knew that sintered and a composite heat pipe is for sure the best, where it's sintered and mesh or, or weave. Uh, what, I, what they were insisting is that gravity affects the performance of the heat pipe due to the mesh right yeah, yeah. And, and yeah that's like maybe provable in a lab but i'm not sure that i agree from a cpu cooler standpoint yeah and and i guess to be clear as well the guy who is answering these questions works in the manufacturing side of the heat pipe so i, I don't know how much testing he does or anything sure you got to trust him at some level so in a, in a lab environment i guess it's it's better the centered would be well, better well, I mean, they said that the uh, the powder actually costs more to produce, yes. so it wouldn't make sense if it didn't perform better to continue right. to produce it. Yeah, so. it, it definitely performs better. I just don't know that gravity matters a lot, right? Because right? they're supposed to just work by capillary action. Right. But, uh, it's, I guess to be fair, if Cooler Master makes giant heat pipes, which they do for some of these companies. The bigger the heat pipe gets, gravity probably starts to matter more versus and, a CPU cooler. Yeah, there's and obviously there's going to be more water in the pipe. Yeah, uh, which I actually didn't know that it was just pure water. I thought it was some kind I of. I thought it was like a propylene or ethylene mix. Yeah, I call it mix, but it's but actually they just said water. Yeah, they just said it was distilled water, um, and the amount that they put into a CPU cooler heat pipe yeah. is minimal enough that you could turn it upside down and shake it, and nothing, nothing. comes out. Yeah, it's drops. Yeah. Um, but they bake those for eight hours at 900 degrees Celsius. Yeah. Um, so that's quite the process for making 50,000 of those a day. Yeah. And the, the problem too is because it's a conductor, the temperature has to be that high because the copper pipe's sitting there conducting all the heat in the oven. It's, it's too efficient yeah. to bake quickly. Yeah. So. Yeah. So it's definitely not a quick process. Despite it coming out and just being just a, looks like a copper tube. Yeah. Uh, but we did get to to bend some of those ourselves. Yep. Um, I held it, up the production line. It was actually really frustrating. I'm sorry, Brian. Well, work on that. Okay. I maybe for our, our annual review, for, we can talk about ways <laughs> I can improve. Yeah. Uh, it's, yeah. It'll affect your salary I have, moving <laughs> forward. I have numbers on that too. It was um. Oh, where is it? It was like. I think it took us about... You averaged about 20 seconds? I think so. I think Something I like averaged that? about 20. Oh, that's right. Eight seconds for a skilled worker. Yeah. To, to just blow through it. Yeah. And there were multiple steps to the process. It So they have machines that will do it for you. Yeah, we saw but those. they were right behind us. Yeah. And they're like, no, no, no. You bend by hand. Yeah. <laughs> so we did. And uh, it was interesting. Yeah, if you get a cooler that's all screwed up, it might have a heat pipe from one of us in it. Yeah, that's yeah. actually a, probably a good bet. <laughs> <laughs>
So then one of the last things that we saw was that skiving machine. Yes. Um, which, again, is not something that I had ever seen. But the, the precision as, uh, with which it was making the cold plates, push it, like cutting the copper, bending the fins up, was absurd. Yeah, and you can see like the water flowing over it too. Yeah. Because they, I think the water's like most of those machines is mostly just for thermals because the machine gets hot. Yeah, and this, the friction of it cutting the metal, it yeah. needs some way to cool it down. But they said that, the, so I forgot to write down the uh, the production of that, the rate of production, but oh, it was I not high. That. It's not. It was like 30 an hour or I something like that? I think that's correct. I think it's 30 per hour and they can do two to three. Right. I did remember that. They put they could put two to three assemblies in that one Skyden machine. Yes, and it is 30. That is, that is what I write down. Yeah. So yeah, 30 per hour. And they had one of those machines. Yeah. So... They That's can, the bottleneck to making AIOs. If anybody ever wants to know why making yeah. something with a cold plate is expensive. prohibitively expensive, that might be exactly why. Yeah. Yeah. So it's making the internal, the micro fins of the liquid coolers. And we've taken a lot of those apart. And liquid coolers use micro, I guess, I mean, your audience knows, yep. use micro fins just to increase surface area that the water is contacting with. And so Cooler Master can go down to a 0.5. No, to no, a, it was more than zero, it was zero zero smaller point, than that. Yeah, it was. Uh, I don't remember the exact. I yeah, I should have taken more. I have it copious somewhere. notes. I suppose. Anyway, the density is very high, and yeah, the uh, the one that they were demoing for us that they put under the microscope. Mm. You when you took it and you hold it in your hand, you I couldn't differentiate the fins. It looked like a block of copper, yeah, like a does, like a fuzzy yeah. block of copper. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that was I think that was the finest that they could produce. Um, which was, it was still pretty amazing. Yeah, the only uh, I think their main limitation was as as it gets increasingly smaller, there's impedance to liquid flow. Yes, so like at some point there's diminishing returns. Right, it's heat. almost like flowing over a solid block. Yes, which which would obviously hinder not your work. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> would not be preferable. Right. Um, so and then you know they ran us quickly through like the assembly of the AMD stock coolers, and we made our own liquid coolers. I forgot about that. Yes. We made our own liquid coolers. Because uh, the, you probably forgot because made here is extremely <laughs> loose. <laughs> well, I'm going to say that I made mine. Uh -huh. You can say whatever you want. <laughs> so uh, I, th I think the, 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 we, we were told we would do a hands-on filling the radiator. Right? Yes. And my thinking was like, oh, I've done that before. Same. Yeah, like, okay, you put the funnel and you pour the water. Yep, done. Yeah. Not done. No. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, you just, you, one of the, it involves like uh, vacuum sealing the top yeah. and then extracting and then refilling it. Um, it's all, it's, it's all obviously at least somewhat automated, uh, but my button pushing for some, for some reason was not working. You, I probably wasn't you know, pushing it right. You really screwed that up. I did actually really screw it up, um, yeah. but you, you did have problems screwing the screw in. I'm so, a good screwer, okay? Well, that's not I what went I, to screw class. That's not what I saw. That's not what I saw. Steve, did you have trouble screwing? No, I'm pretty good at it. Oh, are you? Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that, you ended up, though, eventually... Yes. Figuring out how to push the button. I did push the button eventually. I found the spot to push. You found the spot? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. It took me a while. So it was the green button, right? Mm, you know, I don't even remember. I think it was the, the, the yeah, the green button. With, with I'm not the, even going to comment G spot. on that. Is that what it was called? Was yes. it, is that why there was G on it? Yeah. Oh, uh, I should have probably figured that one out. Uh, my well, now you know. My wife, that's why my wife always complains. <laughs> Uh, so, but, but I mean, that factory was certainly very interesting. Uh, we saw a lot of stuff that we probably didn't expect to see. Yeah. Um, and got, you know, obviously some good content out of it. What you're going to do on your channel is deep dive. Yeah. So we saw some stuff that we didn't necessarily touch on in this video, but you're going to deep dive into on your channel. So if you guys want to see more about the Cooler Master Thermals factory, make sure you check out Steve's channel, Gamers Nexus. Um, where how many two three videos from that from that factory? We should have I think a total of probably like four to six relating to this tour. Okay, and great. It's gonna go down to I don't know how many people are gonna watch this, but how screws are made. 
We did go through a screw factory. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so what, we'll <laughs> see. I think it's gonna get like five thousand views, <laughs> but whatever. It, it was it was pretty interesting. So there was the USB cable factory. There was the screw factory. Yeah, we'll talk about the um, heat pipes at, at detail as well. Yeah, and you uh, the fan testing facility. Yeah, we have that one right. too. Right. So I mean. That, that obviously was interesting to see in person, and Steve's going to have a lot of information on that on his channel, so go check that out. But, uh, hey man, it was great. Thanks for sitting down with Absolutely. me. Absolutely. Um, and uh, get subscribed if you're not already, and check out Steve, and see you guys later. Hey everyone, this is Steve from GamersNexus.net, and today we are talking about Cooler Master and their factories. Brian's actually asleep right now. He's passed out in the corner, had too much wine. So I'm taking over the channel for today. How are your audio levels? <laughs> <laughs>